Good morning. Welcome to God's house. Thank you for joining us for worship today. And uh, just looking forward to a, a great morning with uh, you and, and uh, with the Lord. So why don't we stand and let's just pr proclaim that, that Jesus Christ is King of Kings and Lord and Lords and ask him to reign in us. Over all the earth, you reign on high. Every mountain stream, every sunset sky. But my own request, Lord, my only aim is that you'd reign in me again. Lord, reign in me, reign in your power. Over all my dreams, in my darkest some folks around you and then you may be seated. You are peace. 
life. I give you my trust, Jesus. And you are my God, and you are enough, Jesus. that keep people from knowing God and, and doing his will. And those th things are pride and fear. Now, pride keeps us from recognizing our need for God. We think we're good enough on our own, kind of like the Pharisee in Luke 18, who, who praised God that he was not like all the sinners around him. You know, to be saved and effective as Christians, we must first humble ourselves and run to his arms to receive forgiveness. And after that, we must stay connected to Jesus because apart from him, we can do nothing. We also must be on guard against debilitating fear in our lives. You know, a certain level of, of fear is healthy in our lives. Fear keeps us from doing stupid things and helps protect us from dangers. But fear that turns, into, turns us into spiritual cowards is condemned in the Bible in Revelation 21, where it says, among other things, that the cowardly and unbelieving will be cast into the lake of fire. Now, Peter was afraid of being known as a Christ follower. Jonah was afraid to take the message of God's mercy and grace to Nineveh. Some people are afraid that surrendering to God will mean that they have to go to the jungles of Africa, or worse, 
go to Eldorado Springs like our new associate pastor and his family. To overcome fear and do God's will, we need to do two things. And these are two things that are in a famous old hymn, trust and obey. You know, when we trust God, we can cast our anxiety on him and know that he will be with us no matter what. When we obey, we find the courage to overcome our doubts and fears, which makes us less likely to cave to fear the next time the Holy Spirit asks us to do something. You know, we don't have to be slaves to fear. We can live as obedient children of God. Would you stand and let's, let's sing this song, um, I'm No Longer a Slave to Fear. Whatever anxiety you're carrying this morning, whatever burdens, just cast them all on the Lord this morning and let's just agree to trust and obey. You unravel me with the melody. You surround me with the song of deliverance from my enemies till all my fears are gone. I'm no longer a slave to fear. I am a child.
ladies and gentlemen, that's good news because we've all been slaves. We've all been slaves, some of us to fear, all of us to sin, some to lust. You name it, we've been there, we've done that, we've been slaves, but thank God for the delivering power. He frees us, makes us His child. Would you be seated, please? We're going to go into just a very special moment. Um, our minister of small groups and outreach, they've been here for uh, a few Sundays. We've given them kind of a soft landing but today, we want to just uh, officially install them, so I'm going to ask the chairman of the church if he would please come and uh, lead us in the, this portion of the service. It's hard to do things when you're blind, but I made it up here. Isn't the weather nice compared to what it was three or four days ago? Man, Thursday and Friday... I thought it got pretty rough. Patrick and Rhonda, would you come up, please? By the way, I'm Kent Bell. I'm one of the seven board members in this church. We hired, or maybe I should say we put out the call for Patrick and Rhonda to come. I'm not sure how many weeks ago it's been, but we're glad you're here. Patrick... And Rhonda, we're honored to welcome you as the small groups and outreach pastors of the Eldorado Springs Church of God Holiness. We have been praying for years that God would send the right person to us, and we believe that God has answered this prayer and confident that you're that, that person. This is a divine assignment from God. As an ambassador of Christ, your duties will be many. A few of them will be to lead our small group program that will help us better disciple those who know Christ, as well as to coordinate an outreach program that will help us reach this community for Jesus. You will also be called upon to teach and preach God's word, to visit the hurting, to counsel the an anxious, to strengthen the weak and comfort the sorrowing. You and your wife are to be an example of godliness and holy living, putting no stumbling block in anyone's path so that your ministry will not be discredited. The Apostle Paul says this is a trustworthy saying, if anyone sets his heart on being an overseer, he desires a noble task. God has called you to that noble task. Patrick, if you agree with the following questions the board is asking you, we ask that you say either I do or I will. Will you commit to faithfully preach God's inerrant word in season and out without apology and without compromise? Will you commit to lead this church by personal example, committed to a life of holiness, abstaining from all practices that might jeopardize your witness? Will you commit yourself to loving this congregation through a ministry of prayer and encouragement? <laughs> Will you commit to be God's leader in your own home, teaching your family the things of God according to the Scripture, by word, deed, and le leading them to love Christ and His church? Church, as a board, we're going to ask the following from you. You didn't know you had an assignment when you came this morning, but you have an assignment now since you showed up. We're asking you to love Patrick and Rhonda. We're asking you to pray for Patrick and Rhonda. Honoring Patrick and Rhonda as servants and leaders that God has placed in a position of responsibility in this church. Would you do that, please? Okay. Joe? Pat Patrick and Rhonda, if I could just uh, ask you to uh, stand down there, and I'm going to invite uh, just members of this church family, leaders and uh, others. Would you please, please come? Would you stand? Everyone stand. And if you could just come and gather around them, let's uh, lay hands on them, not hands on their neck, but let's lay hands on them. <laughs> and... Uh, Let's just uh, pray God's 
blessings and honor and favor as they begin uh, this new assignment. Let's pray. Father, we come to you. We bless your name. God, uh, you, you put the pieces of the divine puzzle together in ways that we would have never imagined. We would have never imagined that an amazing family in the city of Seattle would end up in Little Eldredge Springs. But we believe it's of your will. And God, we thank you for leading them to us. Father, the task is great here. We don't have uh, the numbers that Seattle does, but God, we have lost people that are in desperate need of Jesus Christ. They need Jesus in their lives. And Father, I pray that you would enable them as they organize our small groups to be able to disciple those that know Jesus better, and also as they uh, coordinate a plan to be able to reach out to unsaved people, to lost people, God, I pray that you would give them wisdom. And then, Lord, as a congregation, I pray that we would be there to pray for them, to support them, to love them, to encourage them. God, uh, just hand in hand, Lord, we walk together. Lord, we walk together as we're headed towards heaven. Father, there will be stumbling blocks, there will be barriers that we'll have to climb across. But Father, I pray that in the name of Jesus, you, you would help us. And Father, that uh, together as a team, together the staff, the board, the membership, Father, that we would work in the same direction. And Lord, that we would make this a better place. So Father, right now, it is our privilege to be able to install Patrick and Rhonda. And we do so now in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, thanking you in advance for the harvest of souls that you're going to bring as a result of their work. We pray this in Jesus' name, and everybody said, Amen. 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 Let's give them a hand. And Patrick, on behalf of the church, we want to just give you this key here uh, so you can get in the door. We know that pastors only work one day a week, but, you know, during the week when you need to come up, you can come up and, 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 uh, and work. So we, I think you have a couple words for us. Yes, yes, I do. Let me stand up here. Uh, uh, you guys are so loving. I mean, I'm nervous, but as I look out and see you guys, all I see is loving faces, and I want to thank you for that. You've been absolutely welcomed since the day we got here. And um, we have a large contingent, if you haven't noticed us. So we, got, we brought four. So it's my wife, Rhonda, Lindsay, Caitlin, Erica, and James are over here. And there are four sons that are watching online right now and their wives and grandkids and we raised our niece and she and her husband so uh, not her husband her children and the, there's a total of 24 of us and so <laughs> so when we went out to seattle there were four now there are 24 of us and our family is just full of redemption stories and i was telling the the men this morning in prayer time that uh, I have been through many, many ceremonies in my life, very solemn ceremonies. Nothing compares to today in my heart. This is the most important to me. It really is. And I found out, I found that when I was young, everybody knows this, you're strong, you're powerful, you've got your own gifts and talents. And now that in this season, I now know I can't do anything without Jesus Christ and I can't do anything without the body, the body of Christ. I need you. I like being with you. And so I want to share these verses in Peter. It says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything to pertaining to life and godliness, to the knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence, skipping over to 2 Peter 1.10, therefore, brethren, be all the more diligent to make certain about his calling and choosing you, for as long as you practice these things, you will never stumble. So God has called us, our whole family, it's just not just me, He's chosen us for this day and this hour, and I know why. Revival's coming. I, can, I sense it. I, it is here. Revival is already here. As I'm walking in both services, I can tell. And if you get to know me, you know I've been praying for revival for 
years, 20 something years. And so for to be brought here, there's only one reason why. It's because revival's coming and he wants me to unite with you. We're going to be together via team. So I want to thank you for this and I love you guys. It's an exciting day. Ah, good stuff. Um, Patrick has been moving uh, his books and things like that into the office next to mine um, back there where we used to just kind of uh, set everything that we didn't know what to do with in that office. And so we had to, we had to kind of take a little time and excavate the office for him before he moved in. But man, it's been really good getting to know them and and uh, I'm, I'm so excited to see what God does through this part of his body um, in using Patrick and Rhonda uh, in this context to see his kingdom go forward and people pointed to Jesus. Very thankful. Uh, well, thank you for being here today. And thank you, those of you joining us online, uh, Patrick's family and, and all the others. Um, if and I want to I want to thank everybody who helped us on Monday night to have a wonderful Fourth of July event, and uh, that was a lot of you. And so, would you just give yourselves a hand uh, for that? A great event. Um, this Wednesday, we're back with Wednesday evening programs, summer blast Wednesdays for kids, summer Wednesday nights for youth, and then life groups for adults, and. Our kids are going to be having a movie night this week. Uh, a lot of the kids also will be gone all this week at Harmony Hill Kids Camp. That starts tomorrow, runs through Friday. Um, but there are kids groups and, uh, this week, and I'll be at Kids Camp. Cindy and I are dishwashers at Kids Camp this year. I want you to know that all of my Bible college training has finally come to fruition. <laughs> so... I. I'm not kidding about this. I'm genuinely excited to be a dishwasher at Kids Camp. I don't have to prepare anything. I think probably there will be dish soap there already. So, um, but we're excited to go this week. And, uh, the, but there will be Wednesday night kids group this week, youth group as well. Um, so, yeah, that's, that's what's going on this week. Uh, Tim is going to come and sing, and then we get to dig into God's Word together. Um, I'm glad you came this morning. And I'm glad I did too.
our soul brother. I love that dude. love that dude. Just uh, before we enter the study of, of the Word, and you can go ahead and open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 5, but um, we, we are honored to have the Miles family with us, but we are just very sad that in the coming days, we'll be losing another one of our longtime members, Linda Pate, and her husband will be uh, leaving us to go uh, move to Arizona, uh, Casa Grande. And uh, she may be here next week, may not, depending on the movers. But anyway, uh, we wish you Godspeed, Linda. We love you. You're going to be missed. And um, so please uh, just stop in whenever you can. And. Uh, God be with you. Amen. Alexander the Great was one of the greatest military leaders in the history of the world. By the time of, of his death at the age of 33, he had conquered for the Greek Empire most of the known world. In fact, they say that he held in his hands probably more power than other human, any other human being has ever held. Alexander had a dear friend by the name of Clytus the Black. The name had nothing to do with his skin color. They evidently gave that name to, uh, to him to distinguish him from another infantry commander called Clytus the White. But Clytus um, the, the Black and, and Alexander had been close since childhood and and even after Alexander ascended into power, they still remained very close friends. In fact, during a battle in 334, Alexander the Great came under serious attack, and his life was in, in danger. And he was in hand-to-hand -hand combat with two men. One of them was a Persian commander named Spithridates. And Spithridates had gained the advantage with Alexander the Great. And, and Spithridates was using a weapon called a hammer also known as a war hammer, and there were several different variations of this weapon, but some of them look similar to this right here. But during the battle, Spithridati saw an opening where he could pretty much finish off Alexander the Great. He had somehow, of course, Alexander was going up against two of them, but he had maneuvered himself behind Alexander and pretty much had a clear shot to his head with, with this war hammer. So he lifted up his arm, that held that hammer. And, and just as Spithridates began bringing down that hammer towards Alexander's head, and no doubt would have ended his life, Alexander's friend from childhood, Clytus, was able to swing a sword at that arm and completely sever off that arm that held that hammer. And Spithridates was killed. Clytus saved Alexander's life, and as you can imagine, more than ever solidified their friendship. 
But for all of the greatness of Alexander and, and all of the nations and armies that he subdued, Alexander was unable to subdue his greatest enemy. And that was his temper. He would frequently become angry, lose control of his temper, and do things that he immediately regretted. One, one such incident involved his good friend Clytus. After a big victory in battle, Alexander the Great had thrown a big party for some of his closest friends and highest ranking generals, and they were celebrating that victory late one night, and the alcohol was flowing freely. And, and as so commonly happens, under the influence of alcohol, things began to be said and things began to be done that would have never been said, never would have been done had the people not been drinking. And it started out in, in such a classic way. We've heard the same story with different names too many times. Alexander's friend Clytus, very definitely under the influence of alcohol, said something that an also impaired Alexander didn't like. And so Alexander, in response, threw an insult back at Clytus. Clytus returned the insult back to Alexander. And in response to that, and this was interesting as I was studying the history, Alexander grabbed an apple that was on the table and he threw the apple at Clytus' head. And I was curious whether or not his aim was true with that apple, but none of the historical reports I read gave me that information. But, but that apple being thrown escalated the situation. It went from bad to worse. And so Alexander called for a dagger to take this skirmish to a new level. But those nearby that had cooler heads and knew the close relationship between the two refused to give Alexander the dagger. They restrained him and they hustled Clytus out of the room. What was so out of control with anger, and, and this is kind of funny, but Alexander called for his trumpeter to send the call on the trumpet to summon the entire army to go after Clytus. That's how mad he was. But again, evidently, those near him tried to defuse the situation, never issued the trumpet alarm. Well, in the, in the chaos that was going on, Clytus, still very much under the influence of alcohol, was somehow able to get back into the room where a furious Alexander was. And again, he began to throw more insults at Alexander. By now, Alexander the Great's anger had reached a boiling point, and so history records that he grabbed a javelin hurled it at Clytus, his aim was true, and it pierced Clytus' heart. And that night, Alexander the Great, out of control with his anger, killed his best friend in the world. Now, after his anger had dissipated, after he had slept off his drunken stupor, it began to settle in what he had done. He had just taken the life of his buddy, his childhood friend, the one who had saved his life in hand-to-hand -hand combat against the Persian commander, Spithrates. And history records that he was so distraught. He couldn't be comforted. In fact, over the next few weeks, it's said that he did nothing but sob. And he's rumored to have exclaimed, I have conquered the entire world, but I can't even conquer my own soul. Now today as we continue our sermon series on the seven deadly sins, we're going to talk about the deadly sin of anger. Now I know some of you are trying to skip out on the day that we talk about gluttony, but I'm telling you it will be a surprise. Even the angels don't know the day that I will speak on that. God does, but the angels don't. But really when it comes down to it, our, our topic today will probably be even more convicting than the sin of gluttony because I think there are a lot of people who even though they may not have reacted as violently as Alexander the Great, yet they're in a daily struggle with their anger. And from the outside looking in, it appears they have it all together, but, but it doesn't take much and their anger is unleashed. Sometimes, listen, sometimes it leads to doors being slammed, walls being punched, people being chewed out, or maybe even slapped or punched. It leads to jobs being quit on the spot. You get mad at the boss and you say, you take this job and, and definitely not love it. It leads to friendships and family relationships being severed to where... 
They can no longer be a, even be in the same room together. It leads to car accidents because their anger has taken away their ability to drive with control. Anger, anger brings about murders, divorces, computers being thrown across the room. I, I've seen the videos you have too. It leads to basketballs being thrown at players, tennis rackets being smashed, employees being fired, people dropping out of church. It leads to four-letter words Profanity being unleashed simply because people can't control their anger. Now today we will be looking at a scripture from Matthew chapter 5. And, and this scripture is part of the most famous sermon that Jesus ever gave. We, get, we call it the Sermon on the Mount. And so we're going to just look at two verses there because they're packed full and we'll be doing well to get through those two verses but let's break into the middle of the sermon. Matthew chapter 5, verse 21, reads like this. You've heard that the law of Moses says, Do not murder. If you commit murder, you are subject to judgment. Now, as Jesus was preaching that day, I, I can imagine that when Jesus made this statement about murders being subject to judgment, there were people that said, Amen. Preach it. Amen. I mean, we tend to say amen to those things that we're not guilty of. But Jesus goes on. He says, but I say, if you are angry with someone, you, you're subject to judgment. Now, now, that gets a little bit closer to home. There, there probably that day weren't many amens on that statement. You know, Jesus said, if you're angry with someone, and more than likely the context is that the person has gotten mad at, at someone and is mouthing off at, at them, which most of us on occasion, we would have to say, yeah, I got a little mouthy. I'm, I'm, I'm guilty there. So it gets pretty close to home. But Jesus isn't done yet. Look what else he warns about. He said, if you call someone an idiot, oh, oh, now, now, the actual Greek word here is raka. And, um, and some translations uh, interpret it as idiot. Others translate it as fool. Now, I, I'm sorry, I, I, I shouldn't admit this because I'm a pastor and I'm supposed to be perfect and be able to walk on water. I'm sorry to disappoint you that I'm not perfect and I can't walk on water. But, um, but, but I, I like this word raka. And, and at times, uh, just being honest with you, um, I, I want to use this word to describe different people. Because the Greek word raka really means this, O oh, empty-headed one. <laughs> Isn't that an awesome word? O oh, empty-headed one or worthless one. That, that's what the root word of, of raka means. Well, um, it goes on and says, if you call someone an, an idiot or raka, you're in danger of being brought before the high council. Now, why are you in danger of being brought to the court? Probably because of a slander, defamation of character. You call them an idiot. You call them a fool. You call them empty-headed one. And so they might take you to court for slander. But Jesus still isn't finished. And he says, and if you curse someone... Uh-oh. If you curse someone, and some translations say if you call someone a fool, and, and it's super interesting to me because this per particular Greek word is not raka. It, it's more. And if you happen to look up the meaning of that Greek word, you will find that this word actually means, I like this word too, it means dull, stupid, and blockhead. <laughs> Seriously, that's the root word of moray. So you've got raka, uh, empty-headed one. You've got moray, blockhead. I I'm not making this up. You can fact check me on this if you would like. So, so, so two new words probably shouldn't add them to your vocabulary, raka and moray. But, but of course, the context here is, is not calling someone a blockhead in, in fun. The context is that someone is mad and they start throwing out derogatory names, you know, fool, idiot, empty-headed one. And, and then Christ ends up, this verse says, if you do that, if you curse someone or call them a fool or these names, 
you're in danger of the fires of hell. Should I just give the altar call? We'll all come forward. Now, honestly, after reading that, here's what goes through my mind. I, I, I want to raise my hand and say, Jesus, um, Jesus, don't you think that you maybe misspoke a bit here? You know, pre preachers are guilty of that sometimes. You know, they, they get a couple of amens, which we like. It eggs us on, and sometimes before we realize it, we've exaggerated the illustration a little bit, maybe overstated something. And, and so I want to say, Jesus, maybe you got caught up in the moment, and, and, and those amens caused you to overstate this a bit, because surely you don't really mean that when someone gets mad, and they call someone a food, fool, or an Ill idiot, or a blockhead, that they will be subject to the fires of hell. Jesus, you're going to have to help me understand this before I can say Amen. Well, I think there are a couple of reasons why Jesus is so hard on the sin of anger. First of all, Jesus knew that anger many times doesn't stop with simple name-calling. Anger almost always is the reason that arguments escalate beyond just a simple exchange of words. You know, anger can take an argument where we're calling each other names, you know, idiot, moron, blockhead, empty-headed one. And, and, and of course, the, the, today the names uh, people call each other many times would be laced with profanity. But, but if it just stopped with words, it probably wouldn't end up being a huge deal. But, but anger, many takes us way beyond simple name-calling. Just uh, as, as an example here, we have several law enforcement officers in our church. And uh, by the way, we honor them. We honor them. We, we thank them for their service to keep us safe. Are they perfect? No, just as your pastor isn't perfect and just as you aren't perfect either, neither are they, but we honor them and we thank God for them. But one of them was telling me about a traffic stop that he had made some time ago and he didn't share the name, so he wasn't violating any ethical conduct. But this officer caught a guy on his radar gun that was doing 60 to 70 miles an hour on a street that has a posted speed limit of 25. So uh, he turned on his lights, chased him down, and the guy was just in a foul mood, and he finally admitted that he had been involved in an argument with his girlfriend. It escalated, he jumped in his truck and flew down the street, and, and of course was rewarded with some flashing lights behind him. So it went from a simple disagreement to an argument to him flying down a road doing three times the posted speed limit, and, and who knows what happened after his bad day just got worse, being stopped by a highway patrolman, maybe he took it out on someone else. So, so Christ knew that anger many times didn't stop with Simple name-calling, it progressed on to other sins and crimes that were much more serious. So, so I believe Jesus felt that he needed to help us nip our anger before it ever got to the name-calling stage. And that's the first reason that I believe Jesus was so hard on anger that resulted in name-calling. But the second reason that I believe Jesus was so hard on anger is because unresolved anger is a spiritual issue that will destroy us from the inside out. You see, anger hurts the person more who has the anger than the person who receives the brunt of the anger. In fact, the philosopher Seneca described anger as an acid that can do more harm to the vessel in which it is stored than to anything on which it is poured. And so if I can't deal with my anger, I'm the one who's going to pay the ultimate price. Physically and emotionally, it will take its toll on me. Not to mention that, that people, they're not going to want to be around me. Nobody wants to be around an angry person because they're grouchy, they're, they're, they're temperamental. Now, I want you to look up here for, for a minute, just everybody looking up here. You're looking realistically, there are probably some here today who are angry or struggle with anger. Some of you may be angry at a specific person, maybe a boss, a former boss. Maybe you're angry at a friend that let you down or a boyfriend or a girlfriend or a spouse that betrayed you. Maybe the anger is towards this church or another church that did you dirty. 
And then there are those I found that are just angry at everything, everybody, and, and everyone around them walks on pins and needles because they know that you're just like a volcano that's ready to erupt. And so today, we want to look at five possible responses to anger. And I would encourage you to take notes in your bulletin. Uh, there's some stuff that you may need to refer back to, um, so be ready to jot down, down some things. The first way that I can respond to my anger is I can satisfy it. This means I don't get mad, I get even. And, and just being honest, there, there's something humanly satisfying about getting revenge. Now that feeling only lasts temporarily, but doesn't it feel good to give someone a dose of their own medicine? Someone stabs me in the back, I stab them in the back. Someone gossips about me, I in turn say bless their hearts, but then gossip about them as well. You know, uh, we've talked about this, we've laughed about this, but why is it that when we are getting ready to criticize someone, we feel better about it if we say bless their hearts? And it's just almost like we're exempt from gossiping because I said bless their hearts, you know, that's just really spiritual, bless their hearts. They're a blockhead. <laughs> you know, God doesn't fall for those kinds of games, by the way. And, and the problem with satisfying my anger is that I repay a wrong with a wrong, and by doing so, I push God out of the picture. Because in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Do not take revenge, my dear friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, It is mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. So vengeance is God's job. And if we try to get revenge, then we're taking God's job away from him. And revenge just creates a cycle of ugliness, sometimes violence in our relationships. Well, the second response to my anger is, I can express it. This is where people will yell, sometimes curse at the person who cuts them off on the road. This is where we lose our temper and punch a wall, or we go play racquetball and hold the ball in our hand before we hit it and say, this is so-and-so, and then we smash the tar out of that ball. And I know some therapists encourage this behavior. Our, our society glorifies the fact that we stood up for ourselves. You know, I told him the way it was. I let him have it. And, and we brag about it, and people are impressed that we had the courage to really stand up and let him have it. Here's a question for you. How often do you lose your temper? How often do you lose your temper and let someone have it? Did you know that recent studies show that women lose their temper an average of three times per week? Shame on you, women. Seriously, three times, three times a week. But, here we go, man. But do you realize that that same study showed that men lose their temper an average of six times a week? And I know some of you are wanting to elbow the person sitting next to you because you thinking, you're thinking that they're above average. <laughs> they're overachievers. But women, even if you're average, women lose their temper... Three times a week, men six times. Look at what Proverbs says in uh, Proverbs fifteen eighteen. Could, could we just read this uh, verse out loud? I don't know if you can see it there or not. Um, can, can you see it? Is it big enough uh, to where you can read it? On the count of three, let's all read that out loud. One, two, three. A hot head starts fights. A cool-tempered person tries to stop them. Proverbs 15, 18. So when it comes to our anger, we can try to satisfy it, we can express it. Number three, I can displace it. Displace it. You know, this is where I take my anger out on someone else, maybe an in innocent person that has nothing to do with it. And of course, anger rooms, they're the thing right now. They've, they've got anger rooms where they've got different things in there that you can go in and swing a baseball bat or whatever. They've got computers or whatever it is that frustrates you. And, um, and you can go and pay $25 for five minutes to go and beat the tar out of whatever it is. Or if it really gets complicated, 
then it goes on up to $245. But, but that's kind of a big thing, really. In, in cities, they call them anger rooms. Sometimes this is the way it happens. You're at work, and your boss yells at you, and it makes you angry. And so you go home and yell at your spouse, and your spouse gets angry and turns around and yells at your kid. And your kid gets angry and turns around and kicks the dog. And the dog gets angry and turns around and goes after the cat. And that cat gets angry and claws the furniture. And of course, none of that is fair. I mean, think about it. Your cat gets punished by the dog because you got, got yelled at at work. That's displaced anger. Sometimes we take our anger out on our car. Poor car. <laughs> what did the car do wrong? We slam the door, gun the engine, spin the tires. And sometimes, you know, personally, I've wanted to take my anger out on our copy machine. Honestly, our copy machine is full of the devil at times. <laughs> so frustrating. You know, Ecclesiastes 7, 9 says, Do not be quickly provoked in your spirit, for anger resides in the lap of fools. Fourth way we deal with our anger is this, I can suppress it. Now, when we suppress anger, we hold it inside. And there are two different responses here. First of all, someone makes me angry. I know I'm angry, but I grip my teeth and I keep it inside. But the second response to suppressed anger is that we pretend we're not angry. We, we pretend that, you know, what someone did to us really didn't bother us and that the, those hurtful words didn't matter. And, you know, I see this a lot. People who pretend they're not angry, they look spiritual and, and they say, well, I forgave them a long time ago. But it's obvious that the hurt is still there. The anger is still there. And, 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 and I've seen people that when certain topics are brought up, they get tense, they cry, but they say, no, nah, I'm good. I'm past that. No, they aren't. Please understand that if you allow anger, even a little bit of anger to settle in your heart and you don't deal with it, it will eventually surface and hurt you and the people that you care about. Ephesians 4.26 says, do not let the sun go down while you are still angry and do not give the devil a foothold. So before you go to bed, think about any anger that you have in your life and, and do your best to get rid of it so it doesn't get a foothold in your life. So, four ways we respond to anger that are the wrong ways, satisfy it, express it, displace it, suppress it. But the last response is the right way, and that is, I can process it. Now, unresolved anger and hurt and a short temper is a spiritual issue. That's why the Bible talks about anger so much. It's a spiritual issue, and God wants you to give it to him. In Matthew chapter 11, verse 28, it says, Come to me, all you who are weary and carry heavy burdens, and I will give you rest. For some people, their burden is their anger. Uncontrolled anger. And Christ says, bring it to me. Now, for the remainder of our, our time together, let's look at four steps in the process of dealing with anger. Number one, identify what triggers my anger. Now, a trigger on a gun is just a small piece of metal, or sometimes it's plastic, but when we pull that trigger, it causes an explosion, and that explosion propels a bullet forward in what could be a deadly trajectory. And so, when we talk about what triggers our anger, the trigger is the person or the circumstance that causes an explosion in our life. And and that explosion causes us to say something, do something that can end up being hurtful, damaging, or even lethal. Now, something that you need to understand, that we need to understand, is it's really not the trigger's fault. When you pull the trigger on a gun, if that bullet hits something it's not supposed to hit, it's not the trigger's fault. In the same way, when we look at Things or people that trigger our anger, don't go around saying, well, so-and-so just knows how to push my buttons, and, and they're jerks, they're, they're blockheads. And they trigger my anger, and it's their fault that I reacted like I did. It's their fault that I got a speeding ticket in my haste to get away from them. It's not the trigger's fault. And yes, we know that there are people in this world that do try our patience, they do push our buttons, but we can't go around displacing the blame, saying, well, it's their fault because they did this and I just can't take it. 
I can't put up with them. It's their fault. Would you listen to me? People that are under control of the Holy Spirit should be able to control their anger regardless of what that person does to us. We may get irritated. We may get agitated. We may get frustrated. But as Proverbs says in 1911, people with good sense restrain their anger. They earn esteem by overlooking wrongs. And so one of the keys in controlling our anger is to know what triggers our anger so that we can be ready and avoid those situations. So what, what triggers your anger? And by the way, Jesus teaches us that some anger triggers are positive. Jesus got angry towards sin. There, there are some good reasons to become angry. Aristotle wrote this. He said, anyone can become angry, that's easy. But to be angry with the right person to the right degree at the right time for the right purpose in the right way, that's not easy. So knowing when to get angry is the question. And one of the times to get angry is when there is injustice. I hope you will stand up against injustice. I hope that you will stand up for the innocent. I hope that you will stand up for the innocent that maybe are special needs or the innocent in the womb or the innocent that are being bullied at school or at work. Injustice should bring out a certain level of anger within us. But most of the time, our anger is not triggered by injustice. Most of the time, our anger is triggered by our personal selfish reasons. So let me just ask you some questions here. Are we having fun today? What causes you to become more angry? Is it knowing that there are some kids in Eldorado Springs that live in homes where adults scream at them and curse at them and leave them to fend, leave them to fend for themselves? Are you more angry at that or more angry at the person that pulls out in front of you making you hit your brakes? What makes you more angry? How about this one? What makes you more angry? The person who blatantly uses God's name in vain or the cashier at McDonald's who seems to be super slow today? Which makes you more angry? Do you become more disturbed when you think about the 2,000 people in our town who don't know Jesus? And, or do you get more angry when your spouse or your friend says something or does something that irritates you and sets you off? When do you become more angry? You see, if we're honest, most of the time, our anger is selfish. It's not about injustice. It's all about ourselves. Somebody made us wait. Somebody jumped in front of us. Somebody pulled out in front of us. Somebody said something to us. It's not about injustice. It's about convenience. So identify the things in your life, the people in your life, the situations in your life, even sometimes the animals in your life. Whatever it is that sets you off and triggers your anger. Number two, pause and pray when my temper is rising. Thomas Jefferson said this, when you're angry, count to 10. When you're very angry, count to 100. And if you're still angry, keep on counting. Now, this may mean that when you feel your temper rising, that you leave the room temporarily so that you can regain your composure before you say or do anything that might be ungodly. You know, there, there's a simple spiritual discipline called the discipline of, of silence. And, and you see, our anger is usually expressed in hurtful, sharp words. And, and the discipline of silence is the best remedy. Now, this is not the silent treatment where we don't talk to them to show our anger. But if, if anger is a problem, the more we can learn to remain silent when we're angry, the less likely we are, we are to say or do things that we might regret. Look, look at what Proverbs 15.1 says. In fact, let's just read this passage out loud together on the count of three. One, two, three. A gentle answer turns away wrath, but harsh words stir up anger. And that's Proverbs 15, one. 
Now, pausing in the heat of the moment doesn't remove the anger, but, but it keeps you from complicating it by saying something foolish. You know, how many times have we complicated it by saying something really foolish, really dumb, and then we've got to go and make that right? Some people could count all day, all week, and the longer you counted, the angrier you would become because you would be thinking about it over and over again. But that's why you, we, need to, we need to pause and then pray and in the heat of the moment just say a simple prayer god i'm getting angry right now help me to control my anger god help me to remain calm god help me not to say anything foolish pause and pray and then thirdly leave the vengeance to god and respond with love and i know firsthand if we've been hurt or ignored or treated badly it's hard to let our anger go it's easier for us to take matters into our own hands but the Bible speaks clearly to this in the passage that we referred to earlier, if it's possible. As far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. He's saying it may not always be possible. Do not take revenge, my friends, but leave room for God's wrath, for it is written, it's mine to avenge. I will repay, says the Lord. On the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. What? If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. You're kidding. In doing this, you will heap burning coals on his head. And so as we mentioned, it's God's job to deal with injustice against you. And, and if we begin taking on God's role and repay evil for evil, then all we do is create a never-ending cycle of ugliness. If someone hurts me, I hurt them. What are they going to do? They're going to turn around and hurt me. And, and we keep, we have this ugly cycle where we keep hurting each other. The Bible says if you have to confront someone who has angered you, go ahead and do it with love. Matthew 18 talks about that. Follow that formula. Go to them with a calm head, one-on-one -on -one with love. So if you want to get back at someone who has treated you unfairly, love and kindness are much more likely to be successful than cursing them out. And on, on top of that, when we show kindness, the cycle of violence is broken rather than going back and forth like Clytus and Alexander, back and forth, and finally throwing an apple and, and then throwing a javelin. You know, we end it right there with kindness. The cycle is broken. I'm not going to hurt them. They're not going to hurt me. This leads us to the last step, and that is to repair the damage caused by my anger. You know, there are some of us here today Probably we've unleashed our anger on someone. It hurt them. It hurt our relationship with them. God wants to repair those broken relationships in our lives because they have both spiritual and practical repercussions in our life. Because right after the part in the Sermon on the Mount that talked about anger subjecting us to judgment, Christ then says, so if you're standing before the altar, and we didn't read this, but it says if you're standing before the altar in the temple offering a sacrifice to God, suddenly you remember that someone has something against you that says leave your sacrifice there Go and be reconciled to that person, then come back and offer your sacrifice to God. So do you know what Jesus is saying? Let me just bring it down here. If your anger caused you to hurt somebody, don't try to cozy up to God. Don't try to snuggle up to him and ask for his blessings. God, would you bless me today? You know, don't get all teary-eyed on Sunday morning and say, oh, I love Jesus. No, Jesus says, you need to go make it right. You need to apologize. You need to take care of it first before trying to act all spiritual. Do you ever wonder why sometimes uh, you feel distant from God? Could it be that maybe our anger has caused us to hurt someone and we've tried to put that out of our mind, but God is saying, you need to go, make it right. The other part of this passage is practical. The first was spiritual, this is practical. Look again. Matthew 5, but I say, if you're angry with someone, you're subject to judgment. If you call someone an idiot, you're in danger of being brought before the high council. Now, you, you see, if you've gone off on somebody, you've hurt their feelings, they may be getting ready to contact an attorney to take you to court. And, and Jesus is being really practical here. He, he says, if something is not right with somebody, go and make it right before they take you to court. Don't put yourself in a position where you might have to go through an ugly court battle. I have in my hand um, a racquetball racket. Um, 
I started playing racquetball fairly late in, in, in my life. Um, I was in my 30s, which is pretty late to be in a new sport. Now, racquetball was pretty big in Bolivia. Um, in fact, the country of Bolivia, just at that, that time, they had six million people. They were ranked number three worldwide as far as uh, the racquetball uh, rankings. And um, I, uh, I, I, the, the national champ actually became my friend, and I played him different times, and he made me look like an idiot. Um, but this right here is the first good racket that I bought when I started playing racquetball, and um, I, I played quite a bit at that time. I, I'm a has-been now, but at one time I was in pretty decent shape because we played in the Andes mountain range at 11 to 12,000 feet above sea level. So almost at the top of Pikes Peak, a little bit below that, we were playing racquetball. But one day playing racquetball, I made a bad shot. I was so upset at myself that um, I, I took this racket here and um, I banged it against the wall in my frustration. Now, now this racket here is a really good racket. It was. Um, it was not the top of the professional line, but, but it was up there, and especially in, in Bolivia, prices on things like this that were exported, they were so pricey. And, and 35 years ago, I, I think I paid nearly $150 for this racket, and this was while we were on a salary of less than $1,000 a month. But one day in horrible frustration, um, after a bad shot I'd made, I banged it on the wall, and I did it with an attitude. And I happened to look down, and to my horror, after hitting it on the wall, um, I saw that I had broken it. You can't see it, but there's, there's a crack in the frame right there. And again, that was, uh, that was 35 years ago or so, and I, I've kept this racket all of these years. It's worthless, but I've kept it as a reminder of what anger could do. And... Uh, Thankfully, um, again, 35 years ago, I've never broken a racket in anger since then. But I've kept it as a reminder. We need to know that anger is a dangerous sin. So much so that Jesus said, don't, don't even get to the name-calling stage. Because more than likely, name-calling and anger will escalate beyond that. So, so Jesus was saying, just nip it right there. Before you ever start cursing someone, before you start calling them names, stop before you call them a jerk or an idiot or a fool or a blockhead or, oh, empty-headed one. And thankfully, God gives us the power to where our anger can be tamed. God can take our anger and instead give us patience and gentleness and joy. He can tame the deadly sin of anger and replace it with peace. I'm not saying that we won't get irritated or frustrated or agitated. I'm not saying that at all. But we can let God tame it to where it doesn't reach a point to where it progresses. Thomas Merton once wrote these words. He said, we're not at peace with others because we're not at peace with ourselves, and we're not at peace with ourselves because we're not at peace with God. So this week, can we, uh, we, we, we've all got some homework. Maybe this week we need to make some apologies. We've uh, unleashed our anger against someone, and that tension is still there. Maybe this is the week that we just go to them and say, I'm sorry. Don't make excuses. Don't say, well, because you did this, you may be mad. And no, just say, I'm sorry. I shouldn't have reacted that way. Maybe this week will be the week that we're actually able to bite our tongue and God will just tame our anger. Maybe um, 
maybe this will be the week that God can just cleanse us and sanctify us of our anger. So, church, let's be the body of Christ. A few weeks ago, we talked about how he wants, he wants a bride that's without spot or wrinkle or stain in our garments. What are the garments? You know, the linen is just the just the works and the good works and the bad works all of those so is our linen going to be white or is it going to be stained so this week can we just pray God take my anger sanctify it cleanse it and this week will you make it a point to clean up the mess that you've created with maybe an angry outburst whether it's to your spouse to your kids to your boss, to your employee, to a friend. Let's take care of it this week. Shall we pray? Lord Jesus, I ask that, um, that you would sanctify us. God, I pray that you would cleanse us. Lord, the anger was such a major deal to where you said, don't even get to the name-calling stage because it'll probably escalate beyond that. Just stop it before it gets there. So, Lord, I know that in a society that exalts those that stand up and let them have it, use a few uh, choice words, four-letter words, our society says, you showed courage. And, but Jesus, all the times that you were humiliated and treated unfairly, Lord, you took it. And so, Lord, let us become angry at the right things, angry at injustice, angry at bullying, angry at innocent people that are taken advantage of. But, Father, that we would not become angry at just inconvenience on our part. So, God, let us go from here. Make us different. God, I pray that your Holy Spirit, and that's what I've been praying is the Lord this week would be different for us, that we would allow you to mold us and shape us into people of peace. Lord, we thank you for your help that you're going to give us. Thank you for your word that gives us instruction. And thank you for these amazing people that didn't throw any apples at me today. Bless them, I pray in Jesus' name. And everybody said, Amen. Amen. Go in peace.